Okay, welcome to our study for Sunday, July 28, 2024, entitled Live by the Faith of the Son of God. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Uh, last Sunday, we went into a, a deep discussion of how Jesus became the begotten Son of God on Resurrection Day, which was the melding together of Jesus as the perfect man with Jesus as God. And so now that we are in Christ, that uh, God lives through us by our life being hid with Christ in God. And this was a special work that God did through Jesus Christ, as Ephesians 1, 19 and 20 talks about. And this is called that holy thing in Luke 1, 35, which is the Son of God, the new creature, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, uh, the body of Christ or the bride of Christ, it doesn't matter. But it's where the man of God, Jesus Christ, is taken and taken together with the Son of God after he has conquered death and hell. He has the keys of hell and death. And so he becomes the begotten Son of God on Resurrection Day. Um, these are the notes from last week. I just stopped and because uh, we were out of time and I ate and I came back and I'm doing this right after that. So that's why all the notes are still up here. Uh, but it's for uh, Sunday, July 28th. So we're going to continue here. Let's read Galatians 2, 16 through 21. Uh, my goal is to cover 19 through 21. We've already covered a lot of it uh, by explaining how we live by the faith of the Son of God. So uh, that's the title is basically getting into more details of that and talking about verse 21 and hopefully finish the chapter. So Galatians 2, 16 Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Okay, so last time we covered verse 19 and verse 20, uh, but we need to uh, finish that up. Uh, so verse 19, for I through the law, so we talked about what that means is that Christ obeyed the law perfectly, and uh, he became a curse for us by hanging on a tree, uh, taking our sin upon him, taking the curse of sin for us. And Jesus perfectly fulfilled the law, too. He perfectly did. So that, that's how he was able to do that. He did no sin himself, 1 Peter 2.22, Hebrews 4.15. Since he did no sin himself, then he could become sin for us, and the righteousness of God that is in him as a result of his sinless life now could be worked through him to where it would he could become that curse for sin and make the full payment for sin, as we mentioned Isaiah 53, 10 through 11. And let's mention that again, because that gives you the summary. That verse 10, Isaiah 53, 10, Thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. So Christ's soul made an offering for sin. Verse 11, He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. So God sees that uh, Jesus paid for our sin and shall be satisfied. So the justice of God was satisfied in that Jesus made the full payment for sin. Now going back to verse 10, make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. So God sees us in Christ. He shall prolong his days 
God gives Jesus eternal life as the begotten Son of God on resurrection day, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in His hand. That is where God now lives through us. We are taken out of, the moment you trust in Jesus, death, burial, and resurrection is atonement for your sin. You're taken out of Adam, which is death. You're placed into Christ's life. You're identified with His life. And so now uh, you have uh, eternal life, and now you're justified by the faith of Christ. But now you are to live by the faith of the Son of God. And that is Jesus as the perfect man melded together with the Son of God and uh, on Resurrection Day. And that's why he then sits at the right hand of the Father, far above all principality, power, mind, and dominion, and every name that is named. But it's as a man that he does that. Um, but then the part, the Son of God being with him. So then that's why then, in Galatians 2.20, that <clears throat> I can live by the faith of the Son of God. So I'm justified by the faith of Christ, but because He is raised from the dead with that special working that God did in His life to create the holy thing, the new creature, the special work in Ephesians 1, 19 and 20, then that means now you've got Him as the begotten Son of God on Resurrection Day, Acts 13, 33. So now it's not living by the faith of Christ. You're justified by the faith of Christ, the man, but you're to live by the faith of the Son of God because Colossians 3, 3, your life is hid with Christ in God. So Christ is in God, the begotten Son of God, and your life is in Christ, so you are with Christ in God. So when you read and believe God's Word, you're not just living by the faith of Christ, you're also living by the faith of the Son of God. And so you see this new system that is set up. So Galatians 2.19 says that I through the law, through Christ's perfect obedience of that law and by him fulfilling the prophecies there and by him becoming a curse for us, becoming sin for us, making the full payment for sin, the justice of God is satisfied, then I'm dead to the law. And the purpose is that I might live unto God. If I put myself back under the law, we mentioned last time that the flesh then works with the sin nature, works with the law, so that we become exceeding sinful. Uh, and so we just, the law worketh wrath, Romans 4.15 says. So the only way I can live unto God is by this new system. And so let's talk a little bit about that new system now. So these are the notes that we had up here for uh, la at the end of last week. And so now we're talking uh, about the new system. If you put yourself back under the law, and try to obey it, it doesn't work. The law was your schoolmaster to bring you unto Christ, that you might be justified by faith, Galatians 3, 24 and 25. But after that faith has come, you're no longer under a schoolmaster. You learn the lesson of the law that you can't serve God in your flesh. So it's Christ that has to live in you. And that's how you live unto God. So what it is, is a new system. If you look over in Romans chapter 8 and verse 2. Romans 8 and verse 2. Romans 8 and verse 2 says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. So if I operate in the flesh, then I'm going to operate by the law of sin and death. Now I realize that my flesh has knowledge both of evil and good, but it doesn't have the ability to do the good. Uh, it says in verse 18 of Romans 7, Romans 7, 18, For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not that I do. So if I live by the flesh, I live by the law of sin and death. Even though uh, there is no power in my flesh to do good. So I can go to a church and they can tell me what I should do. But if I try to do it in my flesh, there's no power to do it. And so I need to, once I'm saved, don't let my deceitful flesh trick me into thinking that now that I'm saved, my flesh can somehow serve God. They think of the flesh as Christ. But really, it's your spirit that was dead in trespasses and sins that's now been made alive in Christ, Ephesians 2, 1. The Spirit of Christ within, when you cries, Abba, Father, Galatians 4, 6. 
And so then, when you listen to the Spirit of Christ, you read God's Word, you believe what it says. You get the sound doctrine in the inner man, Ephesians 3, 16 and 17. You are strengthened with might by a spirit in the inner man. So then, you use the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2, 16, to apply the doctrine by presenting your flesh a living sacrifice to God, Romans 12, 1, rather than letting your flesh win. And so when you do that, then, you live, Romans 8, 2, then, says... For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. So the spirit is to live by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. It's in Christ Jesus. That's where the life is. Because in him you've got the begotten Son of God. Fully God, fully man, together, and man Christ having the power over death and hell, the keys of hell and death in his hand, Revelation 1.18. And so now the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Now you've been justified by the faith of Christ. And then it is by that faith, it says in Romans 5 and verse 1, Therefore being justified by faith, that be the faith of Christ, Romans 5.1, we have peace with God, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now verse 2, by whom also we have access by faith, that would be the faith of the Son of God, into this grace wherein we stand. So Romans 5, 2. By faith of the Son of God, access into grace. And so Romans 6, 14 says, you're not under the law. Not. Not there. That's very important. Romans 6, 14 says you're not under law, but under grace. And what you do in grace is you live by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Now, faith, Romans 10, 17. Romans 10, 17. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So faith cometh by the Word of God. Reading and believing God's Word. And so you have the faith of the Son of God. It's built up in you as a measure of faith. Romans 12, 3 talks about living by the measure of faith. So Romans 12, 3, you, 3, Romans 12, 3, live by your measure of faith. So you have a certain amount of faith based upon how you know God's Word. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So, in uh, John 6 and 63, in John 6, 63, Jesus says, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So, John 6, 63, Jesus' words to you, our spirit and life. <coughs> Based upon 1 Corinthians 14.37. 1 Corinthians 14.37 says, If any man be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I say unto you are the commandments of the Lord. So Jesus' words to you are the commandments of the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus' words to you are Romans through Philemon. The words that Jesus has spoken to you is the revelation of the mystery that was given to Paul for you word to give it to you. So when you put all this together, what you see is that you justify by the faith of Christ and then you have access by the faith of the Son of God into grace. The way you live in grace is you live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, Matthew 4, 4. Those are the words that are to you. Jesus' words to you are spirit and life, John 6, 63. And so if you live by Jesus' words to you, then you're living, Romans 8, 2, by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And according to 1 Corinthians 14, 37, Jesus' words to you are Romans through Philemon. It's Paul's epistles. Okay, so, um, 
That's how you live unto God. So what we need to do is read God's Word, specifically Paul's epistles, get the sound doctrine from that, believe what it says. Then the Holy Ghost strengthens us with might by His Spirit in the inner man, Ephesians 3, 16 through 17. And now we can live by the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. We walk in the Spirit, Galatians 5, 16. Galatians 5, 16 says, Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. How you walk in the Spirit is you live by the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And this is a new system, and not the flesh, which is the law of sin and death. It's living by the Spirit. And two weeks ago, I put up the graph that I showed you how um, your spirit's made alive in Christ, and you use the mind of Christ in your soul. You present your flesh a living sacrifice. And the way the flesh does is it works the other way. It wants you to live by the flesh, but since no power is in your flesh to do good, then you will live by the law of sin and death in the flesh, whether you're robbing banks or you're trying to serve God. Either way, if you're living in the flesh, you live by the law of sin and death. And so then you don't have the spirit communicating to your soul and presenting your body a living sacrifice. Instead, you've got the flesh doing its ugly deeds and it's working wrath, Romans 4.15, it's sinning. Now the sin doesn't reach your soul due to the circumcision of Christ, Colossians 2.11, but uh, then you're not doing the will of God. You're living by the law of sin and death. The sin isn't counted against you. Death isn't, um, doesn't take hold because Christ has paid for that sin and that death through his uh, suffering and hell, his soul being made an offering for sin. But uh, you're still not doing the will of God. So when you're in uh, Galatians 2, I through the law, in verse 19, I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. Another, a parallel verse to that is, and you probably want to write it next to Galatians 2.19 in your Bible, if you haven't done it already, is Hebrews 9.14. Hebrews 9.14 is a parallel to Galatians 2.19. And uh, Hebrews 9.14 says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Now let's talk about that a little bit so we can understand the details here of what Paul is talking about in Galatians 2. The first step that the blood of Christ, it does, according to Hebrews 9.14, it says the blood of Christ, number one, purges your conscience. We talked last time about how Gentiles in Romans 2, 14 and 15 have the law written on their hearts, their conscience bearing witness. The Jews have that as well. They also have the Mosaic law. So everybody has that conscience. And Galatians 3, 24 and 25 says, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. The the sin nature, so here's what happens. Sin nature works with, I put natures. It's bad enough you got one, you don't want two. <laughs> sin nature, I did it again. I put the S in there again. Third time. Okay, sin nature. No S. <laughs> Works with the conscience to sin more. That's what Romans 7, verses 7 down through verse, we'll say 12, something like that, teaches you. Uh, better, better put 13. I think 13. Yeah. And so you learn the lesson of the law, the conscious, the law of the conscious, that you are a sinner. So once you learn that lesson, you don't want to put yourself back under the law because all you'll do is sin more. So that's why it says in Hebrews 9, 14, that the blood of Christ purges your conscience. And it, in other words, you don't want to live by your conscience anymore. 
what you want to live by, not you can live by a pure conscience, but I mean, you don't want to live by the conscience as it was. You want to live by the doctrine in the inner man. The conscience is part of the mind. Colossians 2.18 says you've got a fleshly mind. 1 Corinthians 2.16 says you've got the mind of Christ. You want to use the mind of Christ, not the fleshly mind. So what it does is the blood of Christ purges your conscience. So it, what that means is purges fleshly mind. Colossians 2.18. Okay, from what? The second thing, it said, dead works. Dead works are things that aren't alive. So it's of the flesh. Anything on the flesh is the law of sin and death. Dead works, um, we're, we're going to say this is um, applying knowledge of good. flesh because you have knowledge of good and evil is what your conscience is you know what's right you know what's wrong and but the problem is you can do the evil no problem but you can't do the good because in your flesh dwells no good thing the power no power in my flesh to do good so the dead works is that you've got the knowledge of good and you try to use that knowledge of good to do good things in the flesh and what the blood of Christ does is it purges your conscience from what? From It purges the fleshly mind from doing dead works. Which means you're going to stop trying to apply the knowledge of good to your flesh. Where you say, I'll please God by doing the Hail Mary passes, by going to church, by saying the prayer, by walking an aisle, by getting water baptized, by joining the church, by paying tithes. Or whatever it is that you're trying to do in your flesh to please God. The blood of Christ says you can't do it. That's why I had to die for you. So when the blood of Christ is applied to you once you trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin, then it, the blood of Christ purges your conscience so that you from dead works, so that you tr stop trying to do good in your flesh because you've recognized that there is no power in your flesh to do good, which is why you believe the gospel. So the blood of Christ purges your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Serve the living God. And that's essentially what Galatians 2.19 says, but this is the details behind it. So Galatians 2.19, I through the law... Jesus Christ obeying the law, and as a result, then the blood of Christ is atones for my sins, and dead to the law, my conscience is pur purged from dead works, that I might live unto God, serve the living God. And the way I do it is living by the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So then, verse 20 now, Galatians 2.20, gives you your identity. It says, I am crucified with Christ. Crucified with Christ means your flesh is crucified with Christ. Um, from a practical, this is a practical standpoint. Your flesh is not literally dead. I mean, I was saved about 40 years ago. Um, if my flesh was literally dead... You know, it wouldn't be here 40 years from now if it's dead. You know, what happens when you die? I mean, Lazarus, three days in the grave. One of my favorite quotes in the Bible. They tell, the, Jesus says, roll the stone away. Three days he's been in the grave. Here's my favorite, one of my favorite quotes. But Lord, he stinketh. <laughs> Why? Because he's been dead three days. His flesh is starting to rot away. Kind of gross, but that's what happens. You know. I would say 40 years ago, my flesh is still intact. So it's not that your flesh is physically dead. I still have a heartbeat. But it's from a practical standpoint. I am not going to try to obey God in my flesh because I've learned the lesson there's no power in my flesh to do good. So Colossians 3.3 3 says, Ye are dead. Ye 
are dead. That's Colossians 3, 3. Meaning your flesh, from a practical standpoint, is dead. I'm going to present it as a sacrifice, but it's living in that it's still here. Again, if, I, if my flesh literally died 40 years ago, and not from a practical standpoint, um, I wouldn't be able to stand here. It'd be all decayed and rotted away by now. It'd just be a pile of bones. Easy kill in the valley of dry bones. Easy kill in the valley of dry bones. Ezekiel 37 there. Lord, can these bones live? Ezekiel, can these dead bones live again? Lord, thou knowest. Uh, we're not that. I'm not dry bones. I'm, I got flesh here. So, from a practical standpoint, your flesh is dead, not physically speaking. There's no dry bones here. Not yet, anyway. Okay. Um, okay, so, I am crucified with Christ means my flesh from a practical standpoint, is dead, Colossians 3, 3. Ye are, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. So, my flesh is dead from a practical standpoint, but it's still here. But how, uh, I, so in other words, from a practical standpoint, it's, uh, it's dead, but nevertheless I live, Meaning, uh, my flesh can still be used. And if you look over in Romans 12, verse 1, Romans 12, verse 1 says, Romans 12, verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So it's by God's mercy that even though you're dead, your flesh is still here. Nevertheless, I live. Because God says, now you can use your flesh to be a living sacrifice, not a dead sacrifice, but a living sacrifice, which is your reasonable service, meaning it's a service based out of reason, understanding that I can live by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, and I can go this way rather than that way. In other words, B.C., it's flesh, soul, spirit, before Christ. AC, after Christ, it's spirit, soul, flesh. The spirit tells my soul, and my soul gets my flesh to do what I should do. Instead of with before Christ, is my flesh tells my soul what to do, and the spirit's really dead, so it can't do anything anyway. It's just the flesh dominating my soul. But after Christ, it should be my spirit dominating my soul. But yet the flesh, by the mercies of God, is still around. Because that way, the flesh can be used as a living sacrifice. You know, there's some things. Why did Jesus have the body of a you know, flesh? Well, there's things you can do in that that God can't do. God says in Isaiah 66, Heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. Where is the house you will build for me? Where is the place of my rest? God wants a body or a vehicle through which he can share his love. So by the mercies of God, even though I'm dead, in my flesh dwells no good thing, that God's, the power of God, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, can work in me and take something that is no good, no value to it, my flesh, and use it for God's purpose as I work this way, where my spirit tells my soul what to do, and then my soul presents uh, my body as a living sacrifice. So basically the flesh, we don't listen to it anymore. Here the flesh controls my soul. But this way, the spirit controls my flesh. And so then my flesh doesn't have any say so in the matter. If I live in Christ, that's how it is. By the way, the Antichrist and those into Luciferianism and Satanism, Satanism they, uh, the spirit is being used uh, this way. And so Satan can use that that way. But as a, someone in Christ, uh, Satan can't do that. So if you try, you know, that, that wouldn't work that way. Uh, because you can't be possessed by a devil because you're possessed by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. Okay, so you present your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service or your service based on reason. And so now going back to our verse, Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. 
flesh from a practical standpoint, ye are dead. Nevertheless, I live so that my flesh can still be used. And then it says, yet not I. That's why Colossians 3.3 3 says, ye are dead, but Christ liveth in me. So here it is, I, my flesh, controlling my soul before Christ. But after Christ, after I'm saved, what it should be is God says, um, I am crucified with Christ, so ye are dead. So what that means then is that if, let's say, after Christ, I try to operate the way I did before Christ, and we talked about that two weeks ago, well, my flesh is, the, the Colossians 2.11 says, there is the circumcision of Christ, the cutting off of the link between the flesh and the soul. So then, uh, I don't have, I don't have any communication here between the soul and the spirit. Uh, but I at least don't have any sin reaching my soul. So that's what it means by ye are dead. Before I'm saved, my flesh very much affects my soul. I sin and my sin is on my soul. I sin more, sin is on my soul. I sin more, I sin is on my soul. But because of the circumcision of Christ, Colossians 2.11, a spiritual circumcision that happens once you're saved, the link between the flesh and the soul is cut. So who you really are inwardly is that soul. And now if you sin in the flesh, it never reaches your soul. So that's why it says you are dead. So it is, but it's a one way cutting off. You can't have the sins of the flesh reaching your soul. But you can, by the mercies of God, have your spirit learn the things of God, the Holy Ghost teaching it to your spirit, communicate it to your soul, use the mind of Christ, and then the mind of Christ can use the flesh here as a, uh, you know, as a, uh, a living sacrifice. So that's why it says, I am crucified with Christ, link between flesh and soul is cut, nevertheless I live, I can still live this way, but the only way that happens is, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And Christ liveth in me by the, the things that we mentioned here, the law, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. You know, in Galatians chapter 4, so let's talk about uh, Christ. Nevertheless, I live, uh, Christ liveth in me. How does that happen? Well, the moment you're saved, you are given, Galatians 4, 6 says, Galatians 4, 6 says, because of your sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you've got the spirit of Christ, which would be in your spirit, crying, Abba, Father. And then first, so that's Galatians 4, 6. And then, 1 Corinthians 2.16, you have the mind of Christ. So Christ liveth in me. What's inside you? In, internally is you've got a soul and you've got a spirit. So John 4.24 says God is a spirit. You live by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. The way that Christ liveth in you is Jesus' words to you are spirit and life. 1 Corinthians 14, 37, Jesus' words to you are Romans through Philemon. So when I read Romans through Philemon, the Spirit of Christ within me cries, Abba, Father, dear Father, I want to do your will. That's, that's what it is. Um, because he first cried that. Uh, the term appears three times in your Bible. Galatians 4, Mark 14, and uh, Romans 8. Romans 8 and Galatians 4 apply to the body of Christ. And uh, Mark 14 applies to uh, Jesus. And he cried, Abba, Father, when basically saying, Not my will, but thine be done. So that's what you do when Christ lives in you. You're crying, Abba, Father. I want to do your will, Father. Well, what is the will of the Father? The will of the Father is to live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God to you. What is that? Jesus' words to you are spirit and they are life. And they are the words to you are Romans through Philemon. So the Spirit of Christ is crying, I want to do the Father's will. The Father's will is in God's revealed word to us. 
and God's revealed word to us is Romans through Philemon. So the Spirit of Christ is crying to you, read Romans through Philemon, read Romans through Philemon, read Romans through Philemon. And then when you do it, and you believe it, the Holy Ghost teaches it to you, 1 Corinthians 2, around verse 12, verse 13. And now, Ephesians 3, 16 and 17 kicks in, which says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may, be, may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. You've got the sound doctrine in the inner man, but then you've got the love of Christ working through that, which is why I read 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3, because knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. We want to always keep in mind the love of Christ, the love of God, or charity working through us. Not just standing on knowledge because then you become arrogant, you get puffed up. But the charity edifies, it's the knowledge applied according to the love of God, which is presenting your body a living sacrifice. So the Spirit of Christ cries, Abba, Father, I want to know your will. So your will is found in the words to me. The words to me <coughs> are Romans through Philemon, Paul's epistles. So as I read and believe that, then the Spirit of Christ knows what I should be doing. Then that communicates, so then the Spirit of Christ communicates communicates sound doctrine and we're throwing in Ephesians 3 16 through I already lost the page here uh, Ephesians 3 16 down through verse 19 so as I read and believe God's word to me then I've got the words of spirit and life Romans through Philemon and that uh, then I'm strengthened with might by a spirit in the inner man, so then the Holy Ghost teaches me the things of God. And so the spirit of so now the spirit of Christ has the sound doctrine in the inner man, and it communicates the sound doctrine to the mind of Christ. And now I've got the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2:16, but then I've also got the fleshly mind, Colossians 2:18 fleshly mind. So now I make the decision. Am I going to walk in the spirit or walk in the flesh? That's the question of Galatians 5, 16. So if I decide I'm going to live by the spirit of Christ, the communicated the sound doctrine to the mind of Christ, I live by the mind of Christ, I present my body a living sacrifice, and then that is how Christ lives in me. And it's specifically, uh, so Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh. So the flesh is still there by the mercies of God. The flesh is sticking around because then I can present my body a living sacrifice so that Christ can live through my flesh. And, uh, and that goes, the reason for that, the reason we still have a vile flesh, the reason God um, works through us like that uh, is if you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verses 6 and 7. So let's go up here now. Um, and I'll leave my very rudimentary uh, <laughs> flesh, soul, and spirit thing up there. Okay, what did I say? Uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 6 and 7. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 and 7. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts. So your heart now, we should also mention about your heart. Your heart is before you're saved, before Christ, the heart is in the flesh. Jeremiah 17, 9 says the heart is deceitful above all things but de and desperately wicked who can know it so what's wicked your flesh 
It says the heart because that's who you are. You're a wicked person and you're bound for hell due to your sin before you're saved. But once you're saved, Jesus said to, uh, or God said to Israel under in the, uh, in the law. Let me find it. Uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, he says this. Uh, let's see. In the book of Deuteronomy, he says... Look, look at Deuteronomy 10, 16. Uh, uh, Deuteronomy 10, 16. And chapter 30. That was just a pen cap because I don't have more than two hands. That's my problem. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, okay? So Deuteronomy 10, 16, and Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. Deuteronomy 10, 16. Deuteronomy 10, 16. God tells Israel, Deuteronomy 10, 16, Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff-necked. Deuteronomy 30, and verse 6, And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. Circumcise your heart. So when, in Colossians 2.11, when it talks about the circumcision of Christ, what it means is not only do you have the link between your flesh and soul cut, but now the heart is now in the spirit. That's who you are. So God looks on the inward man and sees who you are in the soul and the spirit, but your heart is now with the, with the soul, uh, the spirit. It moves there. So circumcision of Christ moves your heart from flesh to spirit. Moves your heart from flesh to spirit. So Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. You'll hear me a lot of times when I quote that, I'll say your flesh is like that. Because once you're saved, the context of Jeremiah 17 is that Israel is in unbelief. So their heart is in the flesh and their heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Once you're saved, your heart is no longer deceitful above all things and desperately wicked because of the circumcision of Christ moves your heart from your flesh to your spirit. Okay, so then it's who you are in Christ. So that's why when I quote Jeremiah 17, 9, if you've heard me do that in the past, I'll change heart to flesh. And I'm not changing God's word, I'm just recognizing this concept of circumcision of Christ. Okay, so 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts. Spirit. That's where you learn. 1 Corinthians 2. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. The Holy Spirit teaches the, spirit, the things of God to you in your spirit. That's how you can live for Christ. Because God is a spirit. You are to live by the words to you, or Jesus' words to you, or spirit and life. You are to live by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So you need your heart to be in the spirit now. As Deuteronomy 30 verse 6 says, If I circumcise your heart, you can love the Lord your God with all your heart. But if I don't do that, you're not going to do that. I mean, have you ever thought of that? Love the Lord your God, you know, the first commandment, this greatest commandment. What's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But my heart is deceitful and desperately wicked, so how am I going to love God in my heart? Well, the circumcision of the heart takes place. So now the heart moves from the flesh to the spirit. Now you can love the Lord your God in your heart. So in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, when God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shine in our hearts. 
spirit to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The face of Jesus Christ is his word. 1 Corinthians 13 said, 1 Corinthians 13 and verse uh, 12, For now, until God's word is completed, we see through a glass darkly, 1 Corinthians 13, 12. But then, once God's word is completed, face to face, my face beholds the face of Jesus Christ in the completed word, because he is the word, John 1, 1. So, the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, verse 7, but we have this treasure, Christ, Christ living in me, in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We have earthen vessels. Translation, God gets the glory. The world, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. The world walks by sight. Most Christians walk by sight. If I go to church with the stained glass windows and a steeple and an ordained minister and I have a big smile on my face and I go every Sunday, then I am serving God. But if I stay at home on Sunday and I study all day Saturday and I teach a Bible study on Sunday uh, from here, well, then I'm a backslidden Christian that's a part of a cult and I'm going to hell. They're doing it by sight. It's, we do the formality of the church and we're good. But there's no substance behind it and they don't care about that. So they walk by sight and not by faith. Billions of dollars are spent every year on makeup, plastic surgery, trying to get liposuction, to have breast enhancements, to have a butt lift, to make the lips bigger, what do they call it? I don't know, the bigger lips... And, uh, you know, just all this stuff that people do. Uh, so much vanity in the flesh. Um, and so they're looking at the flesh. So if God was to change your flesh when you're saved and people walk by sight, they're going to worship you. I mean, people worship these models and these different people that have all this, you know, the Botox and all this stuff that they have done to them. Um, you know, um, beauty products to make their skin look beautiful and look 10 years younger and all this stuff. Uh, they already worship these people. But if God changed your flesh right now and you had the glorified body, well, then everybody would be looking to you and with your sin nature, you'd be prideful. So what God does is he keeps your vessel as vile flesh. You look your after picture, the minute after you're saved is the same as before you're Say, now maybe you have a smile on your face, but as far as what your flesh looks like, um, if you had a little beard, you still have it. Uh, if you were fat, you're fat. If you're skinny, you're skinny. If you're tall, you're tall. If you're short, you're short. You know, oh, it's, it's just all the same as it was before. So then that way, people, the change is on the inward. So then God gets the glory. That's the point. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So you notice in Galatians 2 and verse 20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, this old rotten, dirty, stinking flesh, God keeps around so that now I can have Christ live in me. And it's still the vile flesh, so the excellency of the power is of God and not of us. So now when people notice, if people notice a change, it's not, well, I see you lost 10 pounds. I see you're glowing. I see you look 10 years younger. You know, it's not that stuff. That's not the change they see. They see me living by the faith of the Son of God, that the Spirit of Christ has been edified with sound doctrine, and I use the mind of Christ, and now I present my body a living sacrifice. So Lana dies, and... People at work say, oh, you know, go see a psychiatrist. I even had a Christian tell me that. You need to go see a psychiatrist. And, you know, they're worried about, oh, how is this going to affect him? She died so young and all this. And here I am. Now, of course, you know, I cried and had sorrow and, you know, all that. But they see Christ living in me. And they think, wow, a big tragedy hit Eric's life. And yet 
he's not depressed he's not uh, taking medication he's not seeing a psychiatrist uh, and in fact it just seems like if anything he's doing better now uh, why is that you know things go wrong you know and they say they look at you and they say you know that's why the health and wealth gospel prosperity gospel I mean it's not biblically correct but from a practical standpoint it doesn't make sense if God says we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency the power may be of God and not of us why would God give you health and wealth once you're saved because if he did then people would be focused on that because the world walks by sight and will say and most Christians do too most Christians and so it would be uh, you know people would look at it and say well I want the things of this world it get people to focus on the things of this world but if the change is inward they don't see I've got great health they don't see I've got great wealth but they see God's love coming through me they see you know they just see the fruit of the Spirit love joy peace long-suffering gentleness goodness faith meekness temperance if that's what they see coming through you especially when circumstances are bad because anybody can be joyful when you've got you know you hit the lotto or you get a bunch of money but when things are going bad and you still are joyful well then they'll say well there's something different they see the excellency of the power is on the inward and they don't go to you and say, you know, oh, you did, you look 10 years younger, none of that, because you look the same on the outside. They see the changes inward, that the way you react to tragedies in these bad circumstances is they still see the fruit of the Spirit coming through you. So then the excellency of the power is of God and not of us. And so Christ liveth in me, this is how he does it. The Spirit of Christ given to us, crying, Abba, Father. So now I've got the desire to read God's Word. And if, again, i got to not listen to the flesh. i just got to pretend that doesn't exist. And instead, my heart is in the Spirit. So then I read God's Word. I believe what it says. I get the sound doctrine in the inner man because the Holy Ghost teaches it to me. Then the Spirit of Christ communicates that doctrine to the mind of Christ, which is in me, in my soul. And then I choose to operate by the mind of Christ rather than the fleshly mind, Colossians 2.18. And then... I present my body a living sacrifice and so then I'm living by the faith of the Son of God and we talked about the faith of the Son of God last time to where you had Christ's faith in God's Word to him but the faith of the Son of God goes beyond that because now you've got Jesus as the begotten Son of God the moment that he rises from the dead it's that special work that holy thing Luke 1 the um, the new creature, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And so now you've got, it is that God is combined with Christ. So that living by the faith of the Son of God, you want to think of Colossians 3, 3. Ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. So Christ, because of his perfect life, when God, and he paid for our sin, and made perfect through suffering, so then when he wrote, when God raised him from the dead, now you've got the Son of God melded together with Jesus as the man, having defeated death and hell. Again, he was still God in the flesh when he was on earth, I understand that. But it was just the power over death and hell that he has won. Now he's got that glorified body. And so now you've got... Uh, the Son of God, the begotten Son of God at the resurrection. You've got those two things combined, which you never had before. The power over death and hell through Jesus paying for that and conquering it for us. And so now the Son of God is wrought, uh, or, or, or begotten, and so now you've got Christ in God, Jesus Christ the man with Jesus Christ the Son of God, all together, perfect, no problems, and, and so then that's why Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, and Ephesians 4, 30 says you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. You're sealed with that spirit of promise until and unto the day of redemption. Because of you've got the Son of God with Christ, and Christ lives in you. So when you believe God's Word, it's not just the faith of Christ working through you, but Christ lives in you as that new creature, that holy thing, 
to where it's the faith of the Son of God as you apply the sound doctrine. And so that's how you can be sealed with the Holy Spirit because it's a done deal. Christ has fully conquered death and hell. That's why the circumcision of Christ takes place here. Without Jesus defeating death and hell, there can be no circumcision of Christ. Because maybe his blood applies to your soul, but you could sin again. But the fact, and then you would have, you'd lose your salvation. But the fact that he fully paid for sin, made that full payment, and the justice of God is satisfied, when the blood of Christ is applied, Ephesians 1, 6 says, you are accepted in the beloved. And the beloved, if I learn how to spell, the beloved, according to Matthew 3, 17, is Christ. So God is always pleased. Maybe I should write that on the board. And I'll write it in big letters. And maybe I'll even write to where you can read it. How about that? God is always pleased with you. Well, I committed adultery and then I committed murder. That's what David did. God says, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't see that. I see you're dead and your life is hid with Christ and God. So I see my beloved son when I look at David, when I look at the person who committed adultery and then committed murder. I see my beloved son. I am well pleased with him. God is pleased with you because he looks at who you are in Christ and he treats you as such. 2 Timothy 2. 2 Timothy 2. Here's the worst situation because if you believe what it serves is not a faith is sin. So when you believe God's word and apply it to the situation, then Christ is living in you. But 2 Timothy 2, verse 13, if we believe not. 2 Timothy 2, 13. 2 Timothy 2, 13. If we believe not. That's the worst situation. That means we are going to sin. Whatever we're doing, that's sin. Because whatsoever is not a faith is sin, Romans 14, 23. And if we believe not, then it's not a faith, so then it's sin. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. Who's the he there? God. Jesus Christ is God as well. He is the begotten Son of God. So when you are placed into Christ... He sees you as the begotten Son of God. He is well pleased with you. Always, 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 always. He is well pleased with you because He sees who you are in Christ. So even if you do the sin, if we believe not, yet He abideth faithful, He cannot deny Himself. If we believe not, God abideth faithful. And that is the faith the operation of the faith of God. We talked about last time, briefly. Romans 3.3 3 and Colossians 2.12. The faith of God. In fact, look at the Colossians passage because that tells you about who you are in Christ there. And you can get the details of that there. Colossians 2. Verse 10. Colossians 2. And verse 10. And I think I'll put this down here. How are we doing on time? We got about 30 minutes? Okay. Okay, Colossians 2.10. We got it up here on this board here. Ye are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power. So Colossians 2.10. Him is Christ. So Colossians 2.10. You are complete in Christ. Verse 11. In whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh 
by the circumcision of Christ. So there's that there. So Colossians 2.11, circumcision of Christ, translation, your sins, your sins never reach your soul. Never. Never. Because they've been cut off. The flesh has been cut off from the soul. Um, so, in whom ye also ye are circumcised, with the circumcision made without hands, and put off the body the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Colossians 2.12, bury with him in baptism. So, baptism is identified. You're identified with Christ's death and life. Wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. God is faith. 2 Timothy 2.13 If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. You need to write next to that verse Colossians 2.12. Colossians 2.12 God abideth faithful. It is the faith of the operation of God that raised Christ from the dead. And because you, your life is hid with Christ in God, if God sent you to hell after you believed the gospel you were placed into Christ, then he would have to send Christ to hell. And the faith of the operation of God says he won't do that. He will abide faithful. Christ already went down to hell and paid for your sin, and God wrought him as the begotten Son of God at Resurrection Day, and so he doesn't deserve to go down there again. And so God is faithful to where he will not send Christ to hell again. Therefore, he will not send you to hell because you are in Christ. It's the faith of the operation of God that raised him from the dead. And so God abideth faithful even if we believe not to where you are sealed with the Holy Spirit so that you cannot lose your salvation. So we are to Galatians 2.20, going back to that. So I am crucified with Christ, then nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Uh, I think it's Psalm 37, Psalm 37, verse 23, I went over that in uh, my mornings, my candid conversations, the Psalms in the car. Uh, Psalm 37 and verse 23. Psalm 37, verse 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Well, ultimately, the, that's referring to Jesus Christ as the faith of the Son of God. So he would be that good man once he rose from the dead, the Son of God with Christ. Um, and so... Now you can live by the faith of the Son of God. You are in Christ. Your life is hid with Christ in God. So the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. How does the Lord order them? The 1 Corinthians 14, 37. The words that I speak unto you are uh, the commandments of the Lord. So if you want to... Now in your flesh dwells no good thing. There is none good, no, not one. There is none righteous, no, not one. But when... When you live, when you've got the begotten Son of God, Christ, in you, and you live by the faith of the Son of God, then that is God living through you. And so then that then is God's goodness coming through you. So, uh, steps of a good man. Are ordered by the Lord. Now, if you look at Ephesians 2 and verse 10, Ephesians 2 and verse 10, Ephesians 2 verse 8 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So verses 8 and 9 talk about your salvation. Now verse 10 talks about your sanctification. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Not that we do them, but we walk in them. 
We simply believe God's word. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. You let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Notice Psalm 37, 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. The steps. Ephesians 2, 10 says that we are to walk. Walk in God's good works. What do you do when you take steps? You're walking. See, I'm walking. I'm taking steps. I'm walking. All I'm doing is I'm not doing the works. I'm walking in them. It's sort of like getting on God's treadmill, if you want to say that. It's like, here's the treadmill, and to keep going, all I'm doing is I'm just walking, right? And it's doing, I'm just, God's doing, you know, the treadmill does the work. It's moving. Maybe not a, maybe not a treadmill at the gym. Maybe that's not a good one. Maybe it's the, uh, the, uh, the moving sidewalk in an airport. Because there, you can just, you know, it's basically that moving sidewalk. It's like a treadmill, except instead of going in a circle, it's going down. It's moving you down the road. It's mechanized, and it moves you down there to get you down to your gate faster. At least that's the idea. Um, and you just sort of walk in it. It's doing the work for you, and you just walk in it. You're letting it do it for you. That's the idea here, is you read God's Word, you believe what it says, you present your body a living sacrifice. You try to get out of God's way. You let Christ live in you. And then you're just simply walking in God's good works. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. So our verse, going back to Galatians 2.20, because I do want to get through verse 21 today. And we don't have a whole lot of time left. So Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. So I'm identified with His death so that I can also be identified with His resurrection. We went through that last time, uh, Romans 6, 3 through 7. Romans 6, 3 through 7. Crucify with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. So that's this way here. The Spirit of Christ, Christ Abba Father, I uh, use the mind of Christ and present my body a living sacrifice. That way. And then my flesh... It's just as vile as it was before, but it's neutralized by Christ living in me so that the flesh doesn't control me, but the Spirit of Christ within me controls the flesh. And then the excellency, the power is of God and not of us because my flesh still looks the same, but yet it's doing God's works or it's walking in God's works rather than uh, what it used to be, which was serving its own purposes. So nevertheless, I live yet not I, but it's Christ living in me and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. And we talked about that. That's the begotten Son of God at His resurrection. Who loved me and gave Himself for me. Uh, who loved me and gave Himself for me. So Galatians 2.20. Loved me. Gave Himself for me. That should remind us of Ephesians 5. Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians 5, verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Okay, now you're told why. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So he loved me and gave himself for me. Why? Ephesians 5.26 says, to sanctify me. What is that? Galatians 2.20, live by, live by the faith of the Son of God. If I live by the faith of the Son of God, then I'm sanctified. I've got holy living because it's the Spirit of Christ controlling my soul which presents my body a living sacrifice instead of going the other way and sinning. So Ephesians 5, 26, to sanctify me, explains living by the faith of the Son of God and explains why He loved me and gave Himself for me.
Uh, so you've got the parallel passage there of Galatians 2.20 is Ephesians 5, uh, 25 and 26. Okay, now let's try to cover verse 21. And I haven't even been looking at my notes, so I don't know where I am. I'm on Galatians 2.21. <laughs> okay. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. I mentioned last, or two weeks ago, that uh, if you got the Bible perversions book that I did, um, and you don't have to have this, you can just look it up. You can go to Bible Gateway, you can type in Galatians 2, and then you can add other versions to it, and you can get this table. But um, what I've got here in mine is I've got the ones that I consider the the major differences that you will find among all the translations, how they differ from the KJV. I've got the NIV, New King James, and New Living Translation in here, comparing it to the King James, because at the time this was written, those were the four most popular translations. And uh, if there were things were all three of them, NIV, NKJV, NLT, were different from the King James, they're in here. And if I highlighted them, which is in a gray color, because it's uh, black and white, a lot cheaper that way, um, then those are considered to be important. And if you look in Galatians 2, I've got a whole bunch of verses. I've got verse 3, verse 7, verse 9, verse 10, verse 11, verse 14, verse 16, 17, 19, 20, and 21. And all of those, with the exception of verses 10 and 11, are highlighted. They're very important. So we're down here in Galatians 2, 20 and 21. There are uh, two major differences in Galatians 2, 20. Um, I am crucified with Christ in Galatians 2, 20. In um, NIV, New King James, and New Living, all of them have changed it to, I have been crucified with Christ. Let's write some of these changes down here because it isn't important to understand. Because this will help us understand Galatians 2.21. So in Galatians 2.20, um, where's my marker? Buried underneath the book. Okay, so in Galatians 2.20, the King James Bible says, I am crucified with Christ. It is in the present tense. All of the modern translations say, or it's very similar to this. Modern says, I have been crucified with Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. That's the major change. Uh, the second major change is Galatians 2.20 says, I live by the faith of the Son of God. And the, all the modern translations to change it to faith in the Son of God. So KJB, faith of the Son of God. And modern, faith in the Son of God. Now, verse 21, Galatians 2, 21, um, verse 1, or the, the first, there are two major ones here. Uh, the King James says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. The NIV and New King James says, I do not set aside the grace of God. And uh, New Living says, I do not treat the grace of God as meaningless. So, uh, frustrate, basically, here... And the King James, so now Galatians 2, 21, uh, King James Bible, frustrate. Modern is uh, set aside. And then the second thing is your King James says, then Christ is dead in vain. And uh, NIV says Christ died for nothing. New King James says Christ died in vain. And then New Living says then there was no need for Christ to die. So basically what they're doing is, and the King James, 
Christ is dead in vain. And we'll just say for modern, for the most part, it's Christ died in vain. So what they're doing here is in the King James, I am crucified with Christ and Christ is dead in vain. In the King James, these are, no way to say it, King James, it's present tense. But in the modern, I have been crucified and Christ died in vain. In the modern, it's the past tense. So what it does is in the King James, we're talking about your sanctification because that is in the present. The modern translations, by changing it to a past tense, is now talking about your salvation. So what they do is they're, they're, you don't recognize what the subject is. The reason he says here, and Galatians 2.21, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. It's not that his death was in vain. Because when it says Christ died in vain, what that means is that, okay, his death does absolutely nothing. So you're still dead in your sins, you're still going to hell. If you, so basically what it's doing here since it makes it about your salvation, not I am crucified with Christ, but uh, I have been crucified with Christ. So what they do is by changing it from sanctification, if it's in the present tense, it's talking about what's going on now, your sanctification. If it's in the past tense, it's talking about your salvation, which makes your salvation conditional. But here in the King James, salvation is uh, secure. It is eternal. Because if, let's say, NIV, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. So, if I set aside the grace of God, then Christ died for nothing, so then I'm not really saved. If I set aside the grace of God, you know, people have problems with that over in Galatians 5, 1 through 4, which we'll talk about now uh, pretty soon here. You are fallen from grace, Galatians 5, 4 says. Oh, so you're not saved anymore. N no, it just means from a practical standpoint, you're not walking in grace. And that's what it is here is Christ is dead in vain means, well, Christ died for your sins and his death is not in vain in terms of your salvation. Because the moment you trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is atonement for your sin, now you have eternal life. You're seated together with Christ in heavenly places. You have forgiveness of sins. But from a practical standpoint, if I, I am crucified with Christ and I have Christ living in me, but if I frustrate the grace of God to where the grace of God doesn't work in me, then from a practical standpoint, Christ is dead in vain. From a positional standpoint, Christ is not dead in vain because he's given me eternal life. But from a practical sanctification part, um, his death is doing nothing in my life because I'm living this way, living by the flesh, and the sin never reaches my soul. I'm still saved, but there is no practical application. I'm not getting sound doctrine in the inner man. I'm not using the mind of Christ. But if, uh, so Christ is dead and vain from a practical standpoint. His death, which now makes me in my life hid with Christ in God, doesn't amount to a hill of beans from a practical standpoint. Christ isn't living in me. Um, the works that I'm doing are wood, hay, and stubble. They're going to be burned at the judgment seat of Christ because I'm living in the flesh. And so that's why it says Christ is dead in vain. And then changing that to where I frustrate the grace of God instead of setting aside. If I can set aside the grace of God, I'm saved by grace. So if I set it aside, now I don't have saved, I'm not saved anymore. So this again here of set aside is talking about conditional salvation. 
But if I frustrate the grace of God, the grace of God is still there. But it's frustrated in that it doesn't do the work. So if, the, if I frustrate it, then I still have eternal security. And then the other change in Galatians 2.20, faith of the Son of God changed to faith in the Son of God. Faith in the Son of God has to do with your salvation. When I believe the gospel, even we have believed Galatians 2.16, a man is justified by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. So when I have faith in the Son of God, then that's believing the gospel so that now I have the faith of Christ given to me and I'm saved. But the faith of the Son of God, as we talked about what that means, the begotten Son of God, that has to do with your sanctification. So here we've got two of the most important verses in your Bible about having Christ living in you, how you should live the Christ life once you're saved. And they are not, the modern translations aren't allowing you to see the sanctification because they change I am crucified to I have been crucified and they change Christ is dead to Christ died. So now being in the past tense, they're talking about salvation and making it a conditional instead of talking about your sanctification. And the faith of the Son of God has to do with how you live once you've been saved, your sanctification. Faith in the Son of God has to do with your salvation. You believe the gospel in order to receive the faith of Christ and be justified. So there's your salvation there. And then frustrate the grace of God means I still had the grace of God. It's just not working in my life. Setting aside is I don't have it anymore, so I lose my salvation. And so you've got these just four subtle changes in verses 20 and 21 in the modern translations. And what it does is it takes away your sanctification. And more importantly, what it does in the modern is in the modern you do not see life in Christ. The most important thing you can ever learn, number one, the most important thing you can ever learn is the gospel, how you are saved. Number two, the most important thing you can learn is your sanctification, life in Christ, and that Romans 6 through 8 mainly covers that. You got it here too, but Romans 6 through 8 gives a more uh, detailed treatment of it. Um, right division, King James Bible, they're below this. Now, if you have a King James Bible, if you have right division, it's easier to understand the first two. But uh, the first two are more important to understand than right division or a King James Bible. And what the modern translation does is it takes away your ability to understand how you're saved, because they change faith of to faith in, and uh, it takes away your life in Christ. You can see that just in these just very subtle changes it takes that away. So that's, uh, that's why it's so important to have a King James Bible. Okay, uh, right, so with that, now uh, let's finish the verse. So I do not frustrate the grace of God, what it means, not set aside, but frustrate. And what that means is the grace of God wants to work. You have access, Romans 5, 2 through 5 says, Romans 5, 2 says, it is by... Let's just put it, uh, well, we'll just put it here. Romans 5, 2. By uh, faith, the faith of the Son of God, you have access into grace. And walking in grace means that you're going to live not by the law, but under grace. So you're going to get sound doctrine in the inner man, the law, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, what we talked about. The Holy Spirit teaching your spirit the things of God, being strengthened with might by a spirit in the inner man, using the mind of Christ. So that's what grace is all about. Grace living isn't a license to sin. Grace living is living by the doctrine found in Paul's epistles. 
So by faith you have access into grace. Which means then you, uh, you live by Paul's epistles. And the result is Romans 5, 3 through 5, that when you live by grace, then verse 3, you're going to have tribulations because you're not going by the course of this world. 2 Timothy 3, 12, VA, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. 2 Timothy 3, 12. So then you have tribulations, but you glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So faith gives you access into grace, where you live by Paul's epistles. Now, 1 Corinthians 13, 13 says, Now abideth these three, faith, faith, hope, charity, but the greatest of these is charity. And here in Romans 5, you can see you've got faith in verse 2. So you got faith in verse 2. You've got hope in verse 4. Hope in verse 4. You've got charity or love, the love of God, in verse 5. So these are the three things that God desires to work in you. Faith, hope, and charity. And you get faith, hope, and charity working in you when you live in grace, living by Paul's epistles. And so that's how Christ lives in you. Christ lives in me because the faith, the hope, and the charity is seen through me. So if I put myself under the law, Galatians 2.18, I make myself a transgressor. So then what I do is when I don't live the Christ life, Romans 6 through 8, then I frustrate the grace of God. The grace of God doesn't go away. He still gives me eternal life. But I frustrate the grace of God working in me because I'm living by the law and not by grace. So then when I do that, I don't have faith and hope and charity. That's what the, the grace, the way grace works Grace works by, by, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. So when you work in the faith of the Son of God, you have access by grace, by the faith of Christ. Then you use the faith of the Son of God, living by Paul's epistles, which results in trials, which is going to build hope or confident expectation of a reward or the spiritual, the eternal, you're focusing on that rather than on the temporal and the things of this world. And then that is going to result in the love of God being shed abroad in your hearts by the Holy Ghost, charity. So the way grace works is grace produces faith, hope, and charity, which are the three things that stand. All the spiritual gifts may be set aside, but now abide at these three, faith, hope, and charity. So Christ lives in you by grace, as faith, hope, and charity are built in you. But if you live by the law, you frustrate the grace of God, and you don't have any of these things. I mean, you have the faith of Christ, and you're justified by that, but you don't have hope. That's why churchianity is so concerned about the things of this world and the health and wealth gospel. They're, not, they're looking at the things which are seen. They're temporal, instead of the things which are not seen, which are eternal. They don't have God's love or charity coming through them because they're focused on the flesh. The flesh bites and devours one another. The flesh lusts against the spirit. There's no charity in that. And so frustrating the grace of God comes by living under the law. And so you don't have faith, hope, and charity working in you when you're under the law rather than under grace. So grace isn't a license to sin. Grace is the opportunity for Christ to live in you, producing faith, hope, and charity in you. And... People don't see that because they let the law deceive them in the thinking uh, that grace is bad, licensed to sin. So we got to get under the law. But then you frustrate the grace of God, and then it says, For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. And so if I'm trying to have right living, that's what righteousness is, right living. If I'm trying to have God's righteousness live through me, and I do it by the law, then Christ's death 
does nothing because the way Christ lives in me, it goes back to that whole Romans 6, 3 through 7. I've been baptized in Christ's death, so then I am planted together with him in his death, so I'm also risen together with a newness of life. So if, if righteousness comes by the law, then I don't need to operate in grace. And so then Christ's death doesn't work in me, and so then Christ died in vain, is what it's saying. And, or shoot, not Christ, Christ died in vain, that's the modern. Christ is dead in vain. It has to do with your sanctification, present tense, not your salvation, past tense. Okay, how are we doing on time? We're at an hour and 30. Okay, so um, that's it. We got through chapter 2. Yay! Woohoo! All right. Um, verse chapter 3. Uh, o foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? So going back to why are you back under the law? If you've begun in the spirit, why are you being made perfect by the works of the flesh? So uh, that's what we'll see next time. He'll give Abraham as an example to talk about Christ redeeming us from the curse, which we talked about last time. Uh, so we'll start Galatians 3 next time. Let's close in a word of prayer. Uh, dear Lord, we thank you for the grace of God given to us, not as a license to sin, but as the ability for faith, hope, and charity to work in us, to, for Christ to live in us, so that you are glorified. Help us, Lord, to live by the faith of the Son of God and not by the flesh. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thanks for watching us. We'll see you next time.